Hello, everyone. So, 15 seconds of starting your speaking is very important because that's that 15 seconds can attract your client or can attract your audience. So, let's talk about it today. Be with us until the end. Neil Gordon is with us today. He's a public speaker and communication expert. And uh, we're going to talk about how to convey a unique value in under 30 seconds, really under 30 seconds only. So welcome to my show, Neil. Thank you very much for having me, Patti. It's good to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very excited today because uh, I know speech is so important. And uh, you may talk for a long time, but the first 15 or 30 seconds of your talk is that time you can actually put uh, some impression on others. So let me know first, uh, how did you start your field as a speaker? I know you already done some writing and work as a publisher, work with publishers as well. So how did you end up working as a speaker? The speaking winds up being an extension of the expertise that I've cultivated in the years since I worked for the publisher. I worked for Penguin a number of years ago. And so to talk about my speaking is to also talk about the communication expertise that has just kind of grown in the intervening years. And so after I left Penguin, I was just working as a ghostwriter of books and doing some other content related consultations for clients. And I started to notice that there was a pattern in some of the most effective nonfiction communication, whether it was the top TED Talks or the best-selling nonfiction books or even some of the most popular quotes on websites like Brainy Quote or Goodreads or whatever that is, anywhere where you see language that just really jumps out at people. And what I detected, and this is going back somewhere around eight to 10 years ago, I started to see that there was a certain technique that the most effective experts and thought leaders were using in those contexts, like the books and the TED Talks and all that, but most of the rest of the world wasn't going anywhere near. And so my work as a speaker, as well as my work in communication in general, is about bringing that technique to light and saying, how do we do that? And how does that help us to, to the point of today's show, how to convey unique value in under 30 seconds? Because when you harness the power of this technique, it takes even, could take even fewer than 30 seconds just to get something of significance across to someone else. Okay, so uh, let's have some example. First, I like it uh, for the book because I have a lot of authors connection mm -hmm. in this show and uh, tell them how we can create a hook in the beginning of introduction or starting the book. Mm. And uh, I know that's very important, having the great hook. And uh, then we get back to speaking. Okay, absolutely. With regards to a book, one time I had collaborated with a client on helping him to write his book that we put together a book proposal and sold it to a major publisher for a nice size advanced at that. And the very first thing the acquiring editor said to us when we all got on a call after the deal was made was how much he loved the introduction of the proposal, which became the introduction of the book itself. And it was an important moment for me because for a number of years, I had thought to myself that wouldn't it be great if books just started in this way instead of the way most people start their nonfiction books? And the way that I felt most people started them was just some kind of overview, or it's like the beginning of a scientific research paper where there's an abstract in a couple of paragraphs at the beginning, and it's sort of like that. It's like, it's like trying to find that 
big broad way to cover the whole topic in only a small number of words, which is well-meaning but highly misguided. What we did and sometimes that, it's boring. <laughs> it, yeah, I would. I mean, I don't like to go to absolutes, but I've rarely read a book that started that way that wasn't boring to me. And I would say so when we we wound up having that call and he the editor was so profuse so 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 happy about the about the opening of the proposal and it was really just a story about the author on some random day when a boy came up to him and started, he was in another country and this boy came up and started interrogating him about his music. And it was relevant to the book and it, it made sense in that context. But for our viewers today, the main point is that the first thing that the acquiring editor read when he opened the proposal, or eventually the reader would open when they read when they opened the book, was just a story that sucked them right in right away as opposed to some vague abstract summary. We drew them in right away, hooked them in, and then that got the person to read further into the book, the rest of the introduction and the book as a whole. Um, so what about one first sentence starting your introduction? That could be any number of things, but a good rule of thumb, and, and this wasn't necessarily what we did that day, but in terms of getting some basic tip across for everyone to enjoy. I, I suggest that people could start in a crisis where the first line was, I like, for example, let's say you are in finance and finance and planning and all that sort of thing. So maybe your first chapter is about a client, your, your introduction, excuse me, about a client. And you could start with a sentence like, my client stared at his bank statement and his jaw dropped from how little money was in it or something like that, or something even a little more tangible. And there was about $10,000 less in his account than he thought was in there when he went in the week before or something like that. Some dramatic moment of the money is not where it's supposed to be or something bad happened or I'm out of money and I have no idea how. I once worked with a client to develop a story about how someone showed up at the cash, the cashier, the checkout lane at a supermarket and turns out there was no credit on her credit card and she had to put items back and she was embarrassed and humiliated. And so the first line of that kind of content might have been, I'm sorry, ma'am, you don't have enough on your credit card to pay for these groceries. And it's just a line of dialogue is the very first line of I the like introduction, yeah. right? Just boom, crisis, first line right away. It's like, oh my God, what's this? And then of course you can provide context further into the content. So we can actually apply this in TEDx. We can apply it mm. in any public speaking, right? Yeah, for sure. So so let's have another example, let's say for TEDx, is not just writing a book. I could use an example from one of my clients who used a technique. So a lot of speakers will go out and say, oh, thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to be here. And they visit and they try to ingratiate themselves to the audience and try to be liked and, and popular and all of that. But they're not there to like you. They're there to take your content and do something valuable in their own life. They want change. And so you can draw them in and, and utilize all of the tension that happens at the beginning of a talk when everyone's in the room. This is more for live talks than virtual ones, frankly. And with a live talk, you're there, you get on from stage. And what my client did, instead of visiting and saying, it's so nice to be here, she again started with a crisis where she's talking about a friend of hers. And the first line of the, the talk was, a longtime friend of mine didn't know what to do. And that's just how it started, just boom, started with a crisis. And she explained it more in the following moments of the talk, but just went right into the story right at the top. It doesn't have to be a story, but if there is a compelling way just to suck people in on the first sentence without any visiting or nervous energy, they will just be with you and you'll be able to hear the pin drop. Interesting. So we talk about the start. Let's say, um, let's talk about the rest. How can we engage 
audience to all talk? What a lot of speakers do is that they will have like maybe a five step process or seven, seven tips on how to solve a problem or something like that. And that looks, that works really well for an a listicle kind of article, like five ways to do this or whatever. You might see an entrepreneur or an inc.com or Forbes or something like that. And that works well for those kinds of articles online in written form. But for a talk, these are people sitting there and watching and needing to pay attention. But people just do this thing where it's like, all right, I'm going to sh show you five things today. And then they do one thing and another and another and another. And it just becomes this kind of even kind of, it's okay. We're just going to go from one thing to the next. It's, I like, I call it a uh, lily pad hopping, like a little frog hopping from one lily pad to the next. And now we're going to go on this and do this and do this. And it can create some friction because it's like, okay, I'm going to sit here for 45 minutes and listen to five things. I'll get through it. Maybe at least one of those things will be good for me. Fine. And then they'll disengage and then they'll take out their phones because no one wants to sit there for that long. But what if instead of five things, you lead up to one thing and even more important, Pontia, is that you build up to it with anticipation. So it builds and builds like it's a climax of a movie. And so you draw them in maybe with a mystery and say, all right, my friend, a longtime friend of mine didn't know what to do, like I just said in the example. And then a month later, she had a completely different, she, she had suddenly just made $20,000. She had paid off her credit card and she was on her way to having the best month of her life or something like that. What did we do in those, in that short amount of time to create that transformation? Well, that transformation, how we did that is what we're going to talk about today. And you're just planting a seed of anticipation by planting that mystery at the beginning and then you build up and you build up and you build up and you say, and this is how it was because of this one idea, this fundamental piece of like this take home thing. And again, this is the thing that's in the top Ted talks. It's the most highlighted passages in the top selling nonfiction books. And it is the thing that helps us to convey unique value in under 30 seconds. It's this one technique that I mentioned earlier that I've been noticing for years and then now teaching people about as a speaker and an expert. And so you provide that big idea as that big climactic payoff, maybe provide a few tips, and then that's that's your talk. So they're on the edge of their seats the whole time. It's like, oh, well, what is it? What is it? Come on, tell us. That sort of thing. Way more compelling than I'm going to talk to you about this thing, and now this thing, and now this thing. And I'm just like, I mean, honestly, Pondy, I'm like falling <laughs> asleep, just like I'm going to pass out at the very thought of having to sit through another one of those boring talks yeah i like that yeah. okay so we're gonna have a few second break and we come back again please subscribe to panta Calhoun transition channel and order my book rules of change for the better tune up your mood and transform your life to reach your biggest dreams All right, and uh, I remember when I was a student, <laughs> uh, we had a math teacher and uh, in the middle of her talk, some students were not really interested, so they, um, they went to sleep, they fell asleep. Mm -hmm. And then the teacher <laughs> uh, threw the chalk on them. Yeah, <laughs> Just lovely. Try to get some attention. So how can we do it? Like we, we cannot actually throw a chart, but how can we um, how can we continue this engagement? Uh, how can we create excitement and um, have their attention all the time? A really handy technique, especially for early on in a talk, is to again, go against the grain of what most speakers do. A speaker will really like think about a speaker and their expertise, and they could have been spending decades developing their expertise and they want to get so much of it across. And so they get up on stage and they just start hammering their audience with their content. Like, all right, here's a tip and here's some content, and here's a definition, and here's a technical term, and here's all my fancy jargon, and more and more and more and more and more, right? And all of a sudden, it's like 
people glaze over because they're just overwhelmed. They're just trying to solve a problem. They don't want to develop a new expertise themselves. And so a way that you can do this is instead to frame your content first in terms of a problem that your audience already knows they have and that they care about solving. Let's say you have breakthrough research on how you can manipulate the brain to overcome addiction. And there's a lot of stuff having to do with the brain chemistry and all that. This is all made up. I don't know if this is even something that exists, but let's just say it's all this technical neuroanatomy kind of stuff about brain chemistry and all of that. And you start to say, all right, there's this breakthrough in brain chemistry. And that what we found is that there are certain genetic markers that talk about dopamine production. And it's like, all of a sudden it's like, uh, I don't want to talk about genetics, but what if you talk about how hard it is to quit smoking? What if you just start with the problem that they care about as in how hard is it? I mean, I don't, what's the actual language there? If you're like a lot of people who have been smoking, it's something that's haunted you ever since you got addicted to it. You just thought you'd do it to be cool when you were hanging out with your friends when you were 13, 14 maybe, and then you get addicted to it. And then it's just half a pack a day and that's a pack a day and then two packs a day sometimes. And people make you go outside and people are scorning you and shaming you. Strangers are saying mean things to you because you're pu putting all this poison into your lungs and making us, everyone else breathe all this terrible air. And by this point, they're like, oh my God, that is so completely my life. How do I stop living like this? I don't want this anymore. What that is, is getting people invested in the problem they already care about solving. So you don't have to throw chalk at them to pay attention because when you set up the, the problem as they're feeling it day to day, that's going to be like, okay, I get it. I hate this problem. I don't want it anymore. Pontia, how do I get out of this problem? What am I supposed to do? Please help me. And by doing that, that will like the mystery that we talked about earlier is going to get them invested initially. And then to just say, yes, I'm all about solving this problem. Help me, please. They're not going to be falling asleep because they just are so invested in solving the problem. People are most likely to embrace a solution when it's provided within the context of a problem they care about solving. I like that. Even this methodology is good for attracting cli clients. Yes. Or selling high ticket. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Very good for marketing. Okay. Yes, yeah. it's good because you some sometimes people just think that you're gonna sell something to them. Right. But as you said, for example, me, if um, if I see something that I serve to somebody really yeah. good for her, I try yeah. to talk about the benefits and uh, how really first I say, what is your problem? How can I help you? Right. That's a really good point because you 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 can't sell something to someone that is not really useful for her. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. You don't, it's, not, it's not pushing. It's just trying to help, right? Right, right. And the pushing part is a really good point to bring up there, Ponti, is because there is the potential to make money selling things by pushing them and manipulating them, even if it doesn't have value and you haven't even agitated that problem that they have themselves. You can still have your way with people and manipulate them into buying your stuff. But that becomes more of a values thing. So many people who are on my list or are following my stuff stay around and they continue to get my emails and stuff because I'm not manipulating them into doing anything. It's like, all right, here's a thing that you will likely have see value in if you're struggling with this problem. And then hopefully I'm walking the walk and I'm providing real value in my products and services. And then they take it and they're like, oh yeah, that's really good. And I'm so glad I did this and my life is better because of it. That's what we want. We want people to solve their problems and the way we help them to, to convince them to do that with us is that we speak to those problems as they experience them. 
Yes. No, I have some uh, question from you as an entrepreneur. The moment you think that, okay, I'm going to work for myself. I don't want to work for anybody else. Yeah. I know it's a very hard decision because I made it too. <laughs> uh, what are the three tips you can give us um, that you feel that you, you, you could help, it could help you succeed uh, in your decision? One of the things is to get some kind of feedback from people who you would potentially help as to whether your solution is something that they value. Now, that doesn't mean saying, would you be interested in an eight-week program? It's more like, are you struggling with this problem? It's the same concept. But to first do a little bit of research to say, do people care about solving this problem? Like I, I, I tested out a five-day challenge with my list just a couple of weeks ago where, where it was a five-day challenge to write your TEDx talk. And people were into it and they, they signed up and they signed up for even a greater in greater numbers than even the previous challenge I did with them. And so that's good feedback that people are interested in doing that. And I am going to look at putting that out into the marketplace and seeing how that goes. So the first one is to research whether or not people have the problem that you could potentially help them to solve it with your stuff. The second thing actually is, it's really just a repeat of what we were talking about to frame your stuff, to market your stuff through the lens of the problem, not your solution to focus on how your audience experiences it to meet that. Basically the tip is meet your audience where they're at, not where you want them to be or where you think they should be where they're at, not where you think they should be. And the third tip is really, again, just so that we can even deliver on this unique value in under 30 seconds that we've alluded to a couple of times. With the books and the TED Talks and the ancient quotes and all of that, there's this one technique that I said earlier, which is basically a way to capture your whole secret sauce, like how you do what you do so effectively and powerfully in a single sentence. And so one of my favorite examples is actually is in an ancient book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu, the ancient Chinese military authority. And he wrote this book 2,500 years ago, and we still quote this one line from it 2,500 years later. It's on line 18 of the first chapter, and it's all of warfare is deception. And so he writes all of this content, he has all this knowledge in the book, but that one sentence encapsulates all of it. So if he was able to say, okay, help me to win this war in only one sentence. He would just be able to say, if you want to win the war, deceive your opponent. And so it's just a simple cause and effect sentence. If you want to get this amazing outcome, take this one action. And there's so many examples of it, but the way that becomes powerful in 30 seconds to create, convey unique values, you can start with the problem, it's like, so, so what someone asks, what do you do? It's like, well, and I'll just use myself as an example. Well, a lot of thought leaders and other experts struggle to get their ideas to really stick and attract others to their vision, to their movement that they want to start. But what they falsely think they must do is just the show up and throw up, provide as much information as possible, that the more information they provide, the more value they provide. But people are not empowered by knowledge, by that which they know is true, but rather that which they believe is possible. I help these thought leaders to completely transform their message so that scores and scores of people rush up to them at the end of their talks or, or share their book with a hundred people or whatever it is. And so what I've done there is create like a little elevator speech that's very different than what we usually do. I set up the problem, identify the typical flawed solutions, provide that secret sauce sentence. I call it a silver bullet. And then I explain what I do on the other end of that. And in under 30 seconds, I can still talk about what I do, but I give them a powerful recipe for success. Even if they don't want to work with me, they still have gotten something of value out of the, the 30 second speech. So uh, tell me under 30 second, <laughs> how uh, um, a speech, can help us grow our business? 
If you use that technique where you have the problem, typical solution, your silver bullet like statement, and then describe what you do. The reason why that helps us to grow our business is that with the silver bullet, that one sentence recipe, it empowers others instantaneously where they like, Oh, I never thought of it that way. Or, Ooh, I just got chills or, Ooh, that's a really good point to make about how to solve that problem. And so when you disrupt their understanding of how to solve that problem, like in that one sentence, and they have this epiphanous light bulb moment, they're going to trust you way more than if you just simply list what you do. Oh, well, I, I'm a blank and I do this, 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 and that. And you took 30 seconds just to plow them with all the information about your stuff. You instead provide them with that recipe for success. So we could use another one. Ed Catmull co-founded Pixar. And he wrote a book a number of years ago that was a New York Times bestseller called Creativity Inc. And a quarter of the way through the book, his silver bullet is getting the team right is the necessary precursor to getting the ideas right. And in that one sentence, he provides you with the secret sauce of how to have the best ideas like Pixar does with these movies that are wildly successful commercially, but also very critically acclaimed and often very ambitious ideas. How do you do it? Well, you first have to get the team right. You focus on the people first and then the ideas come second. It's a single sentence. And when you read that book on the Kindle and in the Kindle, it highlights people highlight passages and it aggregates with the most popular passages. The last time I looked, there was like 9,000 people who highlighted that sentence because it was so powerful for them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So what are the three tips that you think that entrepreneurs fail or they, they give up? A lot of people give up because they don't have a powerful response right out the gates and they don't have immediate feedback that it works. And so they give up. And I've, I've worked with people who are like this. They try something, they might even spend $50 in Facebook ads, which for the record is not very much money to see how something does or doesn't work. And then they give up and claim that it doesn't work because they have just that one little bit of feedback. And the truth is, is that if you just go with the data, you could say, oh, well, it really worked here and here. We just didn't solve this problem here. And so let's just work on and iterate that part of it. And then they try a bunch of different things and then something works and then they move forward. And in a digital marketing, cause we're talking about digital marketing in that case, but in another mistake that entrepreneurs make if they're trying digital marketing is that they only try one idea as opposed to put a little bit of money between a whole bunch of ideas and just see which one works best. And let's see, a third tip would be that, I mean, and I, I'm guilty of this too. They don't, actually, I'm not guilty of this anymore. I've really gotten better at this. They will often put stuff out in a way that doesn't lead their audience to opt in onto their email list. So I guess the, the, the mistake, Pontia, is that they don't drive all of their traffic to their list because the power is in the list. You can affect people the most powerfully when you have their attention for an email as opposed to competing with everything on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever. People talk about how big their followings are on social media, but those platforms, A, might just go away someday or shut down or whatever, and you don't own that. They do. They own your list on the social media, but if you get your own email addresses and people opt in, you can cultivate a relationship more intimately and you have it moving forward. I mean, honestly, public speaking and people like me, many of us wound up struggling in the face of the pandemic because public speaking didn't go away, but it just changed a lot. And I have made it through the pandemic okay because I was able to help my list to solve problems more and more. You know, I like uh, the idea you said about the failing. I don't believe in failure because you you get the lesson of whatever happened. Yeah. Uh, but uh, these you listed are so important really to um, have attention to grow your business because I know building your email list is so important, engaging yeah. your clients and sending them email. I know 
uh, some uh, podcasters i know some um, entrepreneurs uh, they don't even have email list yeah and uh, that's so sad because they try so hard and they do a lot of things but they don't have really um, any lead magnet to get their right. clients and keep them or engage them is not really easy Neil to have yeah. all of them in place like having the email list having the yeah. podcast or having um you know other engagement like uh, speaking or facebook live or right. be the different social media and then email list you have to take care of them and there are some ways uh, to have automatic email like um, sequential so as soon as somebody um subscribe you can have a sequence automatically goes to them so as soon as you right. create it you don't need to create it more and more and more but in the beginning it's a bit hard i know sure <laughs> yeah. sure i mean generally the reason why i was able to build my list as i did is because i put a monetized offer at the end so it wasn't just a lead magnet that i needed to pay for traffic or put a lot of time just to get them to opt in to get the lead magnet for free what i did was put a what they often will call a self-liquidating offer, which is the money, the revenue generated by the sale helps to feed the ability to have pay for more ads. And so it just keeps going and it keeps going and keeps going. And so as long as the ads keep working and people, some people keep buying, then you can keep growing your list. And in some cases, if you're truly good at it or very fortunate, you can make money building your list. And so it becomes a very important tool that a lot of folks don't necessarily think to use. And I needed to be taught that myself at one point by other experts more experienced in marketing than I am, frankly. Yeah, because this is a very big um, topic. Yeah. Made this, yeah, I know maybe another time I have to um, go to detail right. <laughs> about this because this is not... Um, happening right now is too much talk so we are very close to the end if you have any suggestion for whoever wants to wants to start entrepreneurship especially during this pandemic what mm. do you suggest i would say if it's a service-based offering or even a product-based offering, if it's more of a digital product, it would be very beneficial to offer free help or products to an initial group of people and get some feedback for how that was experienced by them. Ask them, assuming they got a good result or got a positive experience out of whatever you offered, ask them for testimonials and just build from the the act of serving your initial group because what that does is it not only helps to build some momentum around creating value and getting some word of mouth going and getting the testimonials but it also helps to reinforce to you that your contribution can have an impact and that reinforcement becomes very very important during the darker times because entrepreneurship is very volatile and so during those lower times, it can really be helpful to know that you have impacted others. And it's just a matter of figuring out how to best reach people in the process. You also have a freebie. So mm. tell me about that. Yeah. <laughs> I like to send people to, we were talking about captivating people in the first 15 seconds of their talk. And what if there is a way you could do so that's very much true to your personality so it very if you're more subdued and a little shy, then there's a way to still be very compelling at the start of a talk, even if you're a little shy. Or if you're super theatrical and over the top, then this could help with that too. But whatever your personality is, this quiz that I have helps you to figure out your speaker type and then gives you some tips on what you can do in the opening of the talk so as to draw people in, not just draw them in in the first 15 seconds, but to completely completely be in line with who you are so you feel authentic on stage. And you can find that at neilcanhelp.com forward slash quiz. 
and that will be where you can start to learn about what your speaker type is. Yeah, that's here. Um, and you know, that's your email, right? That's my email down there. So yeah, .com, yeah. you can just go to um, neilcanhelp.com and it's on the website as well. Yes. Thank you so much, Neil. I really enjoyed talking to you and I learned so much. So Thank glad you. to hear that, Pontia. Thank you for having me. Yes. Thanks.